wrap up uh, is to, to look at what we mean by democracy. Time and time again, I want to come back and suggest that when you think you understand what democracy is, you think you got it nailed down, you got three points that make it easy to figure out, it's probably good to go back and rethink. So what I have up on the screen right now is from The Economist magazine. For those of you who don't know The Economist, it's a UK publication. Its primary audience is the business community. It's a magazine published mostly for folks who identify as part of the business world. Its politics in general reflect that. It's a rather conservative magazine. But it's also <coughs> uh, widely considered to be one of the best weekly magazines available in the English world, English speaking world today. The Economist has a great cadre of reporters. They cover the world, not only the business world, but the larger world as well. So whether or not one agrees with the politics of The Economist in general, many people read it because of the quality of its reporting. The Economist has something it calls its Intelligence Units Index of Democracy. So every year, for the past three years, The Economist has gotten together <coughs> experts, reporters, and tried to measure democracy. That's a tough thing to do. How do you measure democracy? Right? There's so many factors that contribute to making a nation state democratic, but they try. And I thought this was a great place to sort of try to wrap up. The Economist says, free and fair elections and civil liberties are necessary conditions for a democracy, but they are unlikely to be sufficient for a full and consolidated democracy if unaccompanied by transparent and at least minimally efficient government, sufficient political participation, and a supportive democratic political culture. I thought that was a very smart way to say it. All right, if you're going to have a democratic state. Free and fair elections, crucial. We've talked about this over and over. Free, fair, open, contested elections are one of the benchmarks of a democracy. And civil liberties, freedom of expression, freedom of association especially. The ability to gather together with like-minded people to pursue your interests and to speak freely about them. So the economist in that first sentence, <coughs> just restating what virtually every political scientist would agree that free and fair election civil liberties are necessary conditions, but The Economist says they are not sufficient. You may remember the, the idea of something being necessary but not sufficient. You need it if you're going to have something, but that alone won't produce it. So what else do we need for democracy? Transparent and at least minimally efficient government. You have, citizens have to be able to look at the government and know what they're doing. One of the criticisms people have in the streets of Cairo it's not only that they don't have free elections and civil liberties, but there's no transparency in the Egyptian government. What happens in the Egyptian government goes on behind closed doors, and no one except a handful of cronies know what's going on. Okay. Sufficient political participation. That doesn't necessarily mean every single person in the society is actively involved in political debate, dialogue, and organizing every minute but some sense of political participation and a supportive democratic political culture. A supportive democratic political culture. I think that's crucial. We've been talking about that off and on all semester. At the beginning of the semester when I asked how much political discussion and debate goes on in the social settings in which you find yourself on a regular basis, most of you reported that there aren't that many places where you live where politics is on the agenda. That suggests that you do not live in a supportive political culture for democracy. That in your day-to-day -day lives there isn't a context in which you can engage. So when we think about democracy, we want to think about the formal institutions required for a democracy. Things like an elected legislature, an independent judiciary, all the things that one learns about in government classes. But The Economist is suggesting we think about these other things as well. Now, The Economist does rate these things. And here is the 2010 Democracy Index. And you see that 
on all of these criteria that the economist has generated to try and quantify democracy. How can you quantify democracy? You can't, but they try. Well, there it is, Norway back up on top. We saw that in some of those other listings, those Norwegians apparently. You know, it, those Nordic countries are going get, to start getting cocky if they end up on the top of every list, you know. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland. Right? You see all the way down and, oh, there it is. The United States ends up 17th. So, you might have been saying through some of these other discussions that maybe I was selecting out only those indexes and rankings where the U.S. looked bad. But here I wanted to make it clear, The Economist, again, is not a radical magazine. It's a business publication. It represents a reasonably conservative point of view. And on its rankings, when it looks at, if you look across the top, electoral processes, functioning government, political participation, blah, 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 it rates the United States 17th, <coughs> which is not meant to suggest we should you know, laugh. It's to suggest that whatever state you live in, including if you live in Norway, there are always ways to make a society more democratic. And that the task, in some sense, of citizens, I would argue, is to do that. Is to always work to make a democracy deeper, richer, to make your society more democratic. Now, one more thing, and then I'll open it up for questions. The, the way I think that we get derailed from that quest to always produce a deeper, richer democracy is that we're presented with false alternatives. And I want to give you what I think are two of the most common false alternatives. Arguing from false alternatives in the world of philosophy and logic is what we would call a fallacy. An argument based on false alternatives is a bad argument. Whatever the specific thing you're arguing, the structure of false alternatives is a bad argument. A false alternative is when you say to somebody, listen, it's either A or B, when in fact it's not either A or B, it's A or B or C, D, E, F, G, and lots of other choices. But by presenting false alternatives, you either have A or B, and presenting one of them that looks much more attractive than the other, then what you're doing is eliminating people's capacity to consider C, D, E, and F. Right? So, if I were to tell you that you have to, I, I don't know why I'm going back to an example here, but you have to support the UT Longhorn football team. Otherwise, you're implicitly supporting A and M. And what, what, what more horrific thing could there be than being a UT student who ends up supporting A&M. So I would say to you, if you don't go to the UT football games, if you don't go tailgating, if you don't support them, you're implicitly supporting A&M, right? Well, no, that's a false alternative. But there's all sorts of ways to relate to the football program. You know, every time I mention football, you people get really stony. Like, those examples are not working, Jensen, you're trying to tell me. So maybe go back off of the football examples. All right. So let's go back to one of the points I made earlier in the semester. When I made the argument that the term the national interest was always to some degree a propaganda term because in a nation of 300 million people, it's hard to identify a single national interest. That because we all live in different places, socioeconomic statuses, that a single national interest almost never exists. There are the interests of people which can conflict. And here's one of the ways that gets turned into a false alternative. People say either support the national interest or you're being selfish, only acting out of self-interest. How many of you want to be selfish all the time, acting only out of, how many of you want to be small, useless human beings concerned only with your self-interest, with no larger sense of the world? No, nobody wants to be that. Therefore, you have to support the national interest. I'm arguing that's a false alternative. Right? That I agree one shouldn't be selfish and act only out of self-interest. I don't think that's any way to be a decent person. But 
When that's presented as the only alternative to supporting the national interest, what is left out is all of the other ways that one can be part of a society that don't require you to capitulate to some, what I would call, mythical national interest, but ways in which you can identify with groups within society, make commitments to ideals and projects. That it's not just the national interest or self-interest, but that's a false alternative. <coughs> Number two. We've talked about this one before as well. Sometimes folks will say you, you should be political, which means participating in electoral politics, in campaigns and elections as we commonly know them. And if you don't do that, then you're apolitical and apathetic. Again, I don't think being apolitical and apathetic is a good thing. I think it's abandoning one's obligations to the society in which you live. But I think this is a false alternative. If you're going to reject apathy and an apolitical stance is the only way you can participate through elections and the electoral process. Well, no, there are all sorts of other ways to participate in the political system that don't require you to engage in electoral politics. And I want to emphasize this over and over again because, as we said at the beginning of the semester, many of you told me that you don't like elections, that they seem sleazy, slimy, dominated by money. People say anything to get elected. It leads people to rhetoric that isn't helpful at thinking critically about the nature of our problems, right? Some of you said that. Are you taking it back or do you still think that's true? So if that kind of politics is distasteful to you, again, I'm not arguing. I, it's distasteful to me, too. It doesn't mean there's never anything useful that goes on in elections or in electoral politics, <clears throat> but elections and electoral politics leave a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. And so if the only, op if the only alternative to electoral politics is being apathetic, well, a lot of people slide into apathy. And what I want to emphasize again is that there are other ways to become politically active. <clears throat> and what it requires is us, for us to expand our notion of politics. And I'm going to give you two examples that are drawn from the local area, just because they're groups I know of. They're going to reflect my political sensibilities and commitments. I'm not suggesting they reflect yours. I'm not promoting the groups. I'm giving them as examples of politics that is not primarily focused on electoral politics. One of the groups that I work with in town is called the Workers' Defense Project. The Workers' Defense Project is a political group in the sense that I'm using it. They don't run candidates. They don't pay much attention to elections. Instead, what they do is look at what they consider to be a problem. And the problem is the exploitation of immigrant workers. Everyone understands that there are a lot of immigrant workers in a city like Austin, yes? You also understand a lot of them are not documented. They do not have papers. In the popular jargon, they're illegal. Okay? If you're an employer and you have an employee who you know to be undocumented, that's a real temptation to exploit your employee. Why? You exploit that person, what, the pers what is the person going to do? <laughs> Go to court and sue you? Very few people are going to take the risk of using legal means to address exploitation when they are not here with the appropriate papers. And so the Workers' Defense Project organizes those folks and advocates for them on issues like wage theft. You all know what wage theft is? Wage theft is when you do work for someone, there's an agreement that you will be paid a certain wage for it, and then you're not paid. So in this area, it happens a lot in the construction industry. Construction company hires a crew to frame a house, let's say. At the end of the week, the crew comes for their, their wages. The foreman, knowing that many of these workers are undocumented perhaps, says, why should I pay them? Screw them. 
there's not much they can do, and refuses to pay. That's wage theft. That employer then is stealing wages that those employees have a right to. The employer is betting on, the, on the, the idea that the employees won't pursue it, but the Workers' Defense Project organizes through, not legal, but through more informal means to recover those wages. They also work a lot on health, health and safety issues. The construction industry is one of the most dangerous industries, and Texas leads the nation in construction worker deaths, and they work on that. Okay, so is that politics? Yeah, of course it's politics. It's serving a, a membership group that needs help in a particular way. But in doing that, the Workers' Defense Project has political goals. <clears throat> they want to empower the immigrant communities that they're working with. And so in addition to the programs around wage theft and health and safety, there are things like leadership development classes and ESL classes. Right? So, this is a political group, even though you will never see them running a candidate in an election. Okay? They're looking at aspects of the existing system they believe to be flawed and trying to do something about it. Here's another group that I've worked with and actually helped start. <coughs> Third Coast Workers for Cooperation. This is a group that we would call a worker cooperative incubator. It's a group that helps people start worker-owned, worker-run businesses, a cooperative. A cooperative business is one in which everyone working in the business is an owner of the business and participates in the management of the business. Instead of employees working for an individual or working for a corporation, the employees own the business. Right. There is a worker cooperative movement in the country and in the world, and this is a local group trying to help people who want to start those businesses. You might say, well, that sounds like a business group. What are you, why are you discussing this in the realm of politics? Because this is another one of those groups that I see as inherently political, a group that looks at the way our economy is structured and says, our economy doesn't provide opportunities for democratic workplaces. A corporation, whatever you think about it, is not democratic. Any of you ever worked for a corporation? I have. What do you all, you've never worked? What do you all, trust fund babies? Come on, some of you have worked, you've had jobs, yes? You've worked for corporations. Right? Were those democratic workplaces in which everybody had a say in how the group, how the uh, operation was managed? Not the ones I ever worked in. Right? Okay, so the workplace which is often considered outside of politics, is a place where we live a lot of our lives. And a workplace can be more or less democratic as well. And while this group has a very specific aim to help people who want to start these businesses acquire the skills necessary. Right? How, do you, how do you write a business plan? How do you learn to do basic accounting? How do you understand the laws of incorporation? All of that technical stuff rides on top of an underlying political goal to democratize our lives, including our work lives. Does that sound political? It sounds very political to me, but you'll never see Third Coast Workers for Cooperation running candidates in an election or participating in elections. They are engaging in political activity outside the electoral process. So the point in, and again, <coughs> I highlight these two groups only because I happen to work with them and I know them. And I know how they work internally. You may have other groups you've worked with or would highlight. That's fine. The point is to use them only as illustrations of ways that people engage day in and day out in political work that has nothing to do with elections, nothing to do with the electoral process, yet is part of what, I would argue, makes a society democratic. What The Economist magazine called a democratic political culture. And the reason I'm going on about this is because your generation is often told that you're apathetic, yes? Old people like me sit and go, uh, if only the young people were more like us. Maybe every generation does that, yes? If only those young people were more like us. Well, I don't do that because my generation has sort of made a mess of things. So I don't really want you people to be more like us. 
because it might just, you know, cause more trouble. But there are folks, and the people who work in these two groups are predominantly young folks, meaning younger than me. People in their 20s, for the most part. <coughs> Very important to expand the scope of our understanding of what is political. Okay?